So today I will give a presentation about the opportunities and challenges of data markets and dividends. And I want to start in my title of the presentation with one simple question, which I really want to motivate you guys to think about, which is how much is your data worth? So let's say I ask you to give you your personal data to me. Um, would you be willing to do it? A very simple question. And of course, that question is very abstract if we look at personal. Um, so I make this example a little bit more radical and uh, take the most personal data I could imagine, which is, would you give me your sexual data? So I know this sounds awkward. Um, also, what, what does it mean, sexual data? Let's, let's specify it even more. What if I ask you about how many times per week you have sexual intercourse, if it's protected or not protected, or how, what's your emotion about like feeling afterwards or not? Would you give that to me? I mean, obviously you'll be freaked out by that question, right? Like as naturally everyone would do and would further depend, the answer of this question depends highly on the me. Um, let's say me is a medical researcher. And this medical researcher basically asks you about your sexual health data in order to find out um, either possible medicaments for treatment of some kind of a sexual transmittal disease or any kind of like maybe uh, investigate um, possible pregnancy complications, right? So that's on the other hand, sounds a little bit more reasonable than if the me would be your insurance guy. Like let's say this guy is literally responsible for your health insurance and he asks you if you like had a good healthy sex life or not, that would be, that would also freak you out. So it really depends on the person who's asking that question. Um, and as you can see also, that has possibly real world consequences. I think the most extreme would be if it could be anyone. Anyone, and especially if this anyone asks for your data for free and he, he even expects it. Like literally, uh, of course you give me your sexual data for free, right? So the question is like, why do I give you like such an extreme and ridiculous case? Um, and who would even do this, right? So the answer is, if I give you an exact number, who, how many people would do that? It's 100 million women. So um, this is about 3% of all women in the world. Um, so you're like, probably like a little bit shocked about this number and where, where, where does this number even come from? Well, it comes from the registered users of menstrual tracking apps. So menstrual tracker apps are among the most popular apps for young women. And it's an app basically um, for the men among us who maybe not experienced with this issue, like um, it's important to like track the period, uh, the menstruation cycle in order for uh, to see if you're healthy or if people want to, for example, um, increase the family or contract the baby. And this would be, for example, a use case. And those apps are free, highly rated. But if you carefully look at one of these apps, so I took Eve, for example, Eve by Glow period, and you read something which you usually don't read, which is the terms of services, you can find something like this section here on the left. So Clo may maintain copies of your content indefinitely, even after you terminate your account. And the section on the right, which says, well, we may decide to share information about your transactions experiences using the Clo service to our affiliates for their everyday business purpose. So, I mean, this is the classical example of like, things are free, but there's no free lunch. Um, and really that also is kind of a little bit shocking for us to, to think about um, that, that this can happen, but of course this business associate purposes could be, as I said, depends really much on the me in the question of who would you give to the data. So if you look at this example, for example, to finish up this a little bit radical example, this image is an image from a researcher called Laura Sismund, and each row you have to interpret as a user of one of those menstrual tracking apps. And this, what you can see, uh, are predictions based on the data she received from, from those magical uh, menstrual tracking apps. So she's a machine learning researcher and trained a model on predicting menstruation, uh, which is, can be seen in the red circles, and can also highly predict the likelihood of ovulation, which is the black circle. So this is immensely useful, for example, for, again, medical health. You can learn more about like, um, the way, like, for example, pregnancy uh, happens through using data, but also you can imagine really, really bad use cases, such as um, someone 
who basically receives the data who's not a researcher, but your insurance guy or even an advertisement person can predict that you're not pregnant now and basically puts in some uh, baby advertisement on your Facebook. So what I want to say with this whole example is that those data products um, are crucial for two things. They're crucial for the good of society. We need data to advance our society. We need data to make medical progress. Um, but it is also crucial for selfish profit maximization, like the personalized advertisement space. Um, so the reason why we are like feeling a little bit shocked by this example is literally because right now we are living in a society which um, is termed a data denial society. What do I mean with that? Data is the new oil, right? Um, that's at least what we hear all the time. It's like a common saying. But if you think about who owns that data, it's not us, even though we are the person who create that data and who are mined by the big companies. It's the data refinery. So data refinery is a stakeholder, which is basically a term for Facebook, Google, all the big tech companies, also for the menstruation app people like Flow, who host your data. And then they can decide on selling the data. They can decide on generating data products after that, generating profit, and that profit flows back to the data refinery, but nothing comes to us because we don't own the data, because we're living in a society of data denial where we think that our data is really not valuable or we really don't want to know anything about it. So that has a lot of challenges and consequences. First of all, um, those big data sellers, those data refineries who are currently the king in this data denial society, um, they can literally misuse the data. Facebook gives data out to sell it. It's no secret. And also like the Cambridge Analytica scandal showed us really much like how, how much not Facebook is caring about the data, right? Also, um, another problem is like, of course, the implications could be really awful. Like, I mean, you wouldn't mind probably like the medical research, but you definitely wouldn't mind like targeted baby advertisement on your menstrual data. This is like, this is not okay. Um, and unfortunately we don't have any say for this because like, um, again, we are not owning the data. We're not deciding what is built and what's not built. So here are like some horrible examples of possible AI applications, which is for example, using your face data to classify if someone has high IQ or not. These are all real companies and all like real news articles. I didn't make that up. Um, so there's a lot of awful examples out there. So can we do better? Is there maybe a way from what people call um, moving from data denial where we basically don't appreciate the value of the data into a more dignified society where, well, um, this shouldn't happen and we know it's wrong. And data dignity is a school of thought which is pioneered, uh, this term is pioneered by researchers at Microsoft, uh, especially Jeremy Lanier, who wrote Minority Report. Um, and it's basically defined as, well, you should have the moral rights to every bit of data and just, that's because you exist now and forever. So the, the reason you should own your data is because it's your data and you exist. Uh, and this is in very strong contrast towards the CLO uh, tracking app model, which says, okay, well, the data is stored indefinitely in our service, even if you delete your account, right? And you don't want it. Um, so if you look at the stakeholders picture again, the same thing. Um, now though, the crown moved from data refinery to the people. And we would basically, uh, not use any like we would basically instead of like giving data for free to companies we would sell this data to the companies which of course means that the data refinery is now a business associate for us people and we would not be able to probably use facebook for free anymore but we would also need to pay for that so it will be a payment uh trans which we call a transaction between us the people and the possible data refinery um for that of course we need the people to rise up so you think this might be a school of thought, but this is actually a real world discussion right now. And a lot of people are like considering that uh, in the policy spectrum, but also in the industrial spectrum. Here, for example, California has been pushing a lot on like companies to have a data dividend, which basically means that, well, those companies should really pay you money for the data you're used to. And even the current, like the recent presidential candidate, um, not Joe Biden, but um, Andrew Yang, he proposed to have something which he called a freedom dividend, which is basically exactly a data dividend. Like, well, you should get $1,000 per month, uh, every American citizen, and that is because we're contributing so much to this data economy. So these are real, these are real political ideas right now out there, which is um, starting to get generated and starting to sparkle. And these also, on the other consequence, uh, has technical implications. So 
um, on the left side, data dignity, as I said, is a term coined initially by Microsoft. And Microsoft has been building uh, internally data marketplaces in order to experiment with this idea. But on the other hand, on the right side, you see here blockchain-based companies. The blockchain itself is a really beautiful example of how technology can enable this new specific kind of thought. Because now uh, the value of data is linked to, inf like information now has a value due to the way that we can transact money, like on this most single bit. Uh, and that also allows us to basically design marketplaces around information. Here you see Erasure, Erasure, which is basically a pilot blockchain platform, a data market. IOTA is a very famous one that sells your data. Um, that allows to sell your data. And Interrupt is something in between, which is even founded by uh, the, the inventor of the world, by Web, Tim Berners-Lee, as a, as a way to basically create a more fair and just worldwide web. Um, but to, to, to come in to the challenges, um, and this is really what I really want to like give you through to think about is that this new of thought, this new of data markets and data dividends comes with reasonable challenges that cannot be solved easily. And I want to discuss quickly a bunch of them. First of all, data is enormous, right? So we know that there's a lot of data out there. So very reasonable questions like, uh, how much do I even get for my data? Like, is that really like so much money that it's worth to design the whole framework around it? And that really is a really good question <clears throat> um, um, because like probably, like if you if you ask real world companies, um, they wouldn't pay for your for your cat image like more than like ten cents or thirty cents. But on the other hand, there's much more other data and other estimates, like for example from the Harvard um, Business Magazine, which says that well, a reasonable mid-sized American family could be able to earn twenty thousand U.S. dollars from the data, like in the in the near future annually. Um, so that is a lot of money. Uh, and why is that the reason? Well, because the whole uh, digital economy is powered by data, right? Which is a trillion dollar segment in our economy. And that basically gives you some right of like some feeling of how much your data might be worth if you split it equally. Data is personal. So the moment you put a price on data, um, that of course depends on the utility of data. So let's take back again the menstrual uh, tracking app example. Well, if you have a certain disease, a medical disease, then obviously your data is probably more valuable for a medical researcher than someone who is normal because it's rarer. But <clears throat> the moment you put a higher price on your data, that might be also a possible privacy violation. So that's a possible economic challenge you have to think about, like how can we, how can we design prices that also respect the dignity uh, and doesn't like give out sensitive information the moment you put a price on your data point. Well, it, it gets inverse. Data is interpersonal. So, well, you don't have sex by yourself, usually you have like, like with someone else. That means that if you share that data, if you basically sell your health data, you sell also your partner's health data, right? Um, and then the question is about really about data ownership. Like, well, should you be able to do this? Uh, should he has a say on this? And these, this is a huge challenge also like how to, how to tackle with this. How do you defend against fraud? One of the big things about data is that it's replicable and easily. You can just copy paste the data, right? So, and of course that destroys the value of a data point if you can sell it a thousand times um, instead of like once, because like it's basically an indefinite resource the moment you, earn, uh, you own it. So in order to really generate value out of data, we need to be able to limit uh, free copies of data or being able to freely copy that data. And that could be a burn towards digital society if we're not able to, for example, stream data anymore, or freely copy data. If we cannot, like the moment we listen to a song, we cannot somehow store that song, but need to give that song somehow back. This, this really constrains us in, in what we can do as a society. Which comes to societal questions. Like if you think about it, the moment you have to now pay for services like Facebook, wouldn't poor people be priced out of the internet then? If like, okay, if they cannot earn a lot of the data and then, they cannot use any of the services. Well, this is a reasonable point, but also another argument would be like, we, back then we had like public libraries, which also like challenged like uh, with membership fees and still we were able to manage that everyone has access to libraries and knowledge. So really, I think this is a society challenge and that has to be like taking into consideration that prices for people should also be varying depending on their income level. And one of the very, very uh, strong challenges is 
do I even want to know about the value of my data? So what I mean with that is, well, it's kind of awkward to know that someone stores my menstrual data. And I, I think of those 100 million women, the, only a very tiny fraction of them are really aware that this is actually happening uh, to them. And I actually did a small experiment myself. So I was like standing in a Starbucks and asking people um, for a Starbucks coupon if, I'm, if I can show them what Google stores kind of data for them. So if you click on like your phone and you can click on Google account, you can click on my Google and then you can see all the recordings Google has about you, like your searches, your voice messages. And I was like asking them, hey, would you be able to, do you want to know? I give you like a Starbucks coupon for this. And uh, believe it or not, 80% of the people were like, no, no, I really don't want to know. Just get, just, just go away, right? So really is society ready to, to basically get out of the data denial phase and, and uh, accept that we, uh, as, as our data is actually of value and people do store it and use it for, for these certain stuff. So uh, should, we, should we really lift the view of ignorance here? Last, data is always biased um, and it is kind of also subjective. So data is, is, is kind of like, if you think about, um, for example, police data uh, in, in the States, who arrests who, you can see that uh, historically, this is strongly biased towards black people. Uh, and this is kind of a challenge which is society itself. And that also should just tell us that we should be aware that um, data itself has those societal challenges as a footprint. And the moment we sell our data, we market our data and we train AI algorithms on the data, we need to be really aware of that. Lastly, um, there are civil political challenges, right? <clears throat> would the tech giants even go for this, right? Would Facebook and Google, would, would it even be ever allowing someone to get paid for the data because the moment you pay someone for their data, you break the illusion that your service is actually free, right? And that, of course, raises a lot of political questions like, well, maybe the market is fine and maybe, maybe it, it helps us to do it, but maybe we need political action and breakdown and actually force those companies to do it. Um, then on the other hand, who should like manage the data? Obviously, as a single person, I really don't have the effort and time uh, per day to look at, uh, to negotiate every price with any kind of the tech company. So this all should be automated. But then, of course, in numbers come powers. So there has been like uh, discussions about people which similar to labor unions, where people work together to form a political organization to have more power. <clears throat> there are certain kinds of data unions or trusts where basically several data owners join together to sell the data jointly to basically accomplish the most value. And this is also a political and societal challenge to organize that. And the end, of course, data dividend <clears throat> itself can be seen as a universal basic income. And we all know how, how, how this is accepted among society. This is, uh, there has been several challenges, even uh, several votes, even in Switzerland about universal basic income. Um, and this really needs strong political will to, to justify in our view. So really to think, uh, about this design of this whole data dignity space, we can <clears throat> we can list values which are really important on the on the top, and also the sections of possible like uh, domains which have to contribute on the left. So, for example, really important values are privacy, protecting your data's privacy, trust in the system, and uh, utility and welfare. That most of us as a society should be better off when we do this, right? And there are some technical limitations uh, we need to solve. For example, privacy needs to be there's no mathematical proper guarantee for privacy yet. Uh, so we need to design systems where we show that things are really private. We need to also provide systems that are robust so we can trust them. And we need to provide systems that are fast and efficient and have good use experience to really like maximize uh, societal wel welfare. On the legal side, we need to discuss about data categories. What kind of, like my sexual health data is probably more privacy uh, crucial than let's say my x-ray data or even less my, my likes on Facebook, right? So we need to have a legal framework on discussing this. We need to also enforce these legal frameworks to generate trust. And we have to have balance and checks to, to guarantee welfare such that no one's misusing this. And lastly, the market itself plays a really huge role. The pricing as discussed can cause a lot of societal issues. We need to have a fair pricing that doesn't violate privacy. We need to provide a market that doesn't fail in order to generate trust. And we need to have a sustainable growth and not uh, end up again in monopolies and all like issues, which we, we currently have. So really that, that sums up my presentation and I want to uh, start a discussion with, so what is your data worth? Thank you so much.